I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. I hope you're doing well this morning. I hope you are able to get outside yesterday. Was that not great weather? Nice fall day, and we have another one like it today. So please get outside and enjoy it. So if you've noticed here at St. John's, uh, this is the first Sunday of Advent. And we are intentional about this being Advent here because we think Advent is important. And with Thanksgiving already here this week, we are all very aware that Christmas is coming. Christmas is coming. And we want you to slow down a bit before we get there. We want you to slow down a bit. We want you to slow down and prepare. Prepare. See, the world wants you to speed up. Go shopping, go to parties, live at an even faster paced life that we already do. That's how the world wants you to prepare for Christmas. And I'm not saying that isn't fun. I love a good party too. But our tradition in church tells us to slow down and prepare for Christmas in a different way. Listen to Jesus' parable again. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. In other words, slow down, look around you, be mindful. Don't miss what is happening all around you right now. That is Advent. That is how we prepare for Jesus coming into our lives, by not being distracted. Again, pay attention to the parable. Stop being distracted. That's how we prepare in Advent. And so this year, we begin this Advent season with Thanksgiving this week, right? Certainly an appropriate time of preparing. Thanksgiving takes me back to my grandparents' house, right here in Knoxville. They lived over off of Luttrell in the Fourth and Gill area. And I have fond memories coming to Knoxville when I was a child. Even when we lived in Memphis, I remember that long, boring drive on 40. The interstate had asphalt patches with an almost rhythmic spacing. Do you know what I'm talking about? That do-do, do-do, do-do. I remember being put to sleep as we'd come all the way over here to Knoxville. And we'd make it a couple of times a year. Usually Thanksgiving was one of them, and we'd have the traditional meal. Usually some cousins, some aunts, some uncles were around. Lots of activity, lots of laughter, a ton of food, good country cooking with gravy on everything. I can't get away with that, that anymore. I have wonderful memories of Thanksgiving here in Knoxville with our big, crazy family, a lot of joy. But then nighttime would come. Nighttime would come. And some of us grandkids would be assigned to sleep in what was called the middle bedroom. The middle bedroom. And it was the middle bedroom because it was in the middle of the house and there were no windows in it, which in turn made it very dark at night. And there was a closet on the left side of this room. So the bed's over here, the closet's over there, so you're sort of propped up looking. And I was the youngest, so I kind of wanted a light on, but I was the youngest, so the older children didn't want a light on. It was dark, very dark. And my attention was on that closet door. <laughs> and not so much the door, but the black doorknob. The black doorknob. It was so dark. But somehow, my eyes could always see this doorknob. And as I would lay there trying to fall asleep, I just couldn't help stare and stare, waiting for that doorknob to turn. <laughs> Here I was, this little kid, everyone having the time of their lives during the day in the light, but when night came, when darkness came, I couldn't sleep at all. I couldn't sleep at all. I just fixated on that closet doorknob to the point, to the point that I was exhausted the next day for Thanksgiving, I wasn't able to enjoy the Thanksgiving holiday like everybody else. You know, all through my childhood, that doorknob never did turn. <laughs> in fact, the only door that did open in that room was the door that my grandmother came through, usually singing, smiling, laughing. She was old Methodist, had these good Methodist hymns, smell of bacon and biscuits. That was the door that opened my awesome grandmother. You see, my fear distracted me then, and although I'm not scared of the dark now, I certainly still have distractions. I've got distractions. Distractions that take me away from truly enjoying the moment. 
We are such a distracted society, aren't we? <laughs> we are all very distracted. Last Friday, a young man came to church and asked for someone to pray with him. Well, that's kind of my job, and I look forward to doing that. So being downtown, that happens a lot. So I left my office, and I walked over here, took him into the chapel. I let him in. I sat down in the front pew. It had been raining that day, and he was pretty wet. I thought he was just trying to get out of the rain in the back of my head. You know, he was just trying to get out. He looked pretty rough. He was visibly upset. He had tats up and down his sleeve, old sneakers on, old sneakers. I hardly said a word to him other than introducing myself. I just let him in the chapel. I sat down there, and I let him go, let him start talking. And he's talking and talking. There was some crying in between the talking. He was suffering a lot. Felt bad for the guy. I'm just listening to him. He's mostly rambling. I'm trying to figure out what he's saying, make sense of it. And he does this for about five or ten minutes while he's crying and going on and on. Well, he starts looking around the chapel, and it stops him. He actually stops dead in his tracks, and he says, what a beautiful place. He's looking at the paintings, he's looking at the stained glass, then he turns to the altar and the flowers, and as he's staring at the altar and the cross, he proceeds to take off his shoes. He takes off his shoes, now, at this point, I'm wondering, oh boy, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> Is this guy okay? But thankfully, I kept quiet, and he got down on his knees, tears streaming down his face, and he lay down at the foot of the altar, hands outstretched, crying, prostrate at the altar. Went on for a couple minutes. After a while, he got up. He was calm. He was somehow centered now. He wiped the tears from his face. He didn't say anything else to me other than a thank you. He put his shoes back on. He shook my hand and he left. His affect had changed when he left. He was a changed person when he left. He was no longer distracted. You get it? What I witnessed was a man who moved from the darkness to the light. He went from the darkness to the light. I tell you guys, I love this church because it happens. If we allow ourselves to stop being distracted, we can realize that our lives are holy. Our lives are holy. Every day is holy. Every single minute of every day is holy. Every moment is holy. So for this Advent, don't be the scared little boy who stares up, stays up and looks at that dark doorknob, scared, waiting for it to turn. Jesus is not going to come get us like that. He's not the boogeyman. He's not the boogeyman. Rather, learn from this grown man who decided to stop being distracted. He stopped rambling. He realized that this life, this life right now is holy. It is holy. You know, in a few minutes, we're going to be baptizing Blakeland and Duncan into this holy life. And so we're promising to help them in their spiritual journey. As our prayer said earlier, to cast away darkness, put on the armor of light, to help them learn that God is love, that God is life. What a beautiful day it is. It is a beautiful day. We are so happy for you all as the church receives its newest members. And I hope all of you all have a great Thanksgiving week. And don't be distracted. Instead, be present with your family. Be present with your friends this week. Put the phone down. Enjoy the food, the fellowship. If you find yourself relaxing on Thursday, maybe with your shoes off, maybe your shoes are off, propped up in the living room, talking with your loved ones, don't forget it. You are on holy ground. Amen.